Tony Tsai, who's a master's student here at Thinkabed. And he's going to talk about uh, his uh, plan about what kind of research he plans for his uh, master's thesis. So, please hands for Tony. Thanks, Kang. Um, yeah, like Kang said, I'm going to be here to talk about um, what I propose to do this year in my master's thesis for the HIT lab. Um, so the title of my work is going to be is uh, Augmented Reality for Remote Collaboration. And basically today I'm going to be talking about what I plan to do, um, what I've done so far, and yeah, kind of the goals of this project. So firstly, I'll just give you a brief introduction about myself, because uh, I'm new to the lab. Um, then I'll go over the goal of this work, which is what we're trying to achieve. Um, the survey of what I've done so far, kind of looking at different technologies and algorithms to complete this work, and then the kind of the plan of how I'm going to implement it and where it's going to go from here. So first up, um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in Taiwan, but I moved to New Zealand about 15 years ago, where I've studied my undergraduate at Canterbury University in electrical engineering. And there I did uh, software engineering, hardware, integrated circuits. And those are kind of my main three focuses. Um, after that, I did some postgraduate courses in machine learning. So that uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, and that mainly focused on discrete algorithms, such as um, temporal difference networks, artificial neural networks, and stuff. Um, but also dabbled a little bit in things like uh, support vector machines and uh, hit a Markov models. So um, I'm going to tell you now about the, uh, the, the goal of this, the goal of my work for this year. And this work is actually uh, partly sponsored by ABB. So they are a power systems company. So they deal with the transformers that uh, shuttle power around and switching stations and stuff like that. So they actually approached the HIT lab. And they were after essentially what you see here, which was an effective way of remote collaboration with uh, technical support tasks. So what that basically means is if they have a technician on the field, they may not have the expertise or the knowledge to fix a certain piece of equipment out there. And what we aim to do is provide them with a, a remote link to someone at back, back at the office so they can support the, the technician in the field in repairing this task. And this is basically going to involve um, a couple of things. So it'll overlay, um, it'll overlay some augmented reality information for the technician so he can get more uh, access to data and information that he might not have on the field. And also provide uh, uh, a recreation of the environment for the person back in the office. So he can have more situational awareness about what's happening. So you know which transformers are down, which system needs replacing, stuff like that. So the main requirements for this, so for this to be able to work, we're going to need it to be hands-free. The technician can't exactly be um, kind of fiddled with on a joystick while repairing, uh, repairing the, the work. Um, he's going to need access to all the new information. So this is going to be achieved with a heads-up display, where information can be overlaid onto the technician's field of view. And yeah, he can, he can therefore. Uh, perform the tasks better. Um, the, other problem, the other problems that have occurred in the past when these tasks have tried to have been operated is that the remote operator back in the field may not be as aware of what's happening around uh, in the field. So what we propose to do is create a, recreate the scene in three dimensions for the operator. Now, uh, ideally, we'd like to focus on um, consumer-level products. So we're not going for anything that's very expensive and needs a lot of battery and it's going to require the technician to carry a backpack full of gear. There are current systems available right now that achieve uh, what we're trying to do, but they are just that. They are quite bulky, they're quite heavy, and they're very expensive to operate. So we're hoping that with, this, uh, with new technology and the new algorithms that have been coming out, we can improve on this work. 
the last requirement for this is that it's going to need to be able to operate in remote locations. So a lot of the transformers and switching stations are actually located well away from city centers. So you may not have a great uh, internet access. The best we can probably hope for is something like 3G, so we can send the data remotely over the wireless networks there. Okay. So to, to basically to um, to achieve these tasks, we're basically going to need uh, an algorithm called SLAM, and I'll go over that in the next slide. And that's basically my main area of focus for this work. So SLAM. SLAM stands for Simultaneous Local Localization and Mapping. And basically, it's a, it's a very general term for a collection of algorithms where, <clears throat> where, the, where the robot is trying to do two things at the same time. It's trying to locate itself. Uh, <laughs> it's trying to locate itself within a map of an unknown environment. And it's trying to recreate that map for the end user. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay. Yep. So, so like, like I was saying before, SLAM uh, requires two operations to kind of happen at the same time. It's going to uh, recreate a map of the environment for the robot, and it's going to let the robot position itself within that environment. So what I've actually shown here is uh, examples of these two, uh, this, this algorithm running. On the left, we have the an algorithm called PTAM. And on the right, we have an algorithm running uh, called Fast Slam. Now, what to be able to extract its position in the environment and to be able to create a map of the environment, um, the Slam algorithm basically does a couple of things. The first thing it does is feature detection. So from the sensor inputs, it gets an uh, idea of where it is and actually finds certain features in the environments. So like on the PTAM example, these are kind of corner angles of the keyboard, um, lines on the desk, and stuff like that. Um, for FastLAM, they actually use a laser rangefinder. So they basically get laser, uh, distance measurements from the robot, and they use that as feature points to reconstruct the map. Now, for any SLAM um, algorithm to work, it kinda, it's going to depend heavily on the sensors that you use. So I'm going to talk about the different devices that we're going to be using. So these are, these are relatively new devices that have been coming in. Um, the first one I'll talk about is a depth sensor, a camera, and inertial sensors. Um, I'll also talk about quickly the, the, the platforms that we use, we're going to use to implement the devices. So the first device is actually a depth sensor. And I was actually talking previously um, in the FastLAM example about the depth sensor being a laser rangefinder. So that works great. It's very accurate, but it's only uh, one dimensional. So it produces out a beam, and it only measures that direct beam. Very recently, we've had new devices introduced, uh, like right here, which is called the Connect. And this actually uses um, structured light to find range. So rather than projecting a single laser point out, it projects a dot matrix, uh, a dot pattern onto the scene, and then uses that information to calculate the distance from certain pixels to the, to the camera. Now, this is quite great because it means it's a lot quicker. It, the, 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 it doesn't need to scan the environment like a laser rangefinder. Um, it's got a pretty decent range, um, seven to six meters. And beyond six meters, uh, human stereo vision actually kind of fades away as well, so we don't really need that much detail beyond that anyway. Uh, pretty good range of view, and yeah, um, some of the benefits of this is basically, like I said, it captures the entire scene in one go of the depth information. One of the drawbacks is that this data is kind of is actually quite noisy, so we can't directly use the data into our system. We're going to need some pre-processing and stuff like that. The other disadvantage of this is the power draw. So this device is actually quite power hungry. It's drawing one amp at 12 volts on average. So that's 12 volts of power. And if you can imagine that in a backpack system, you're going to need some pretty decent uh, batteries to get this, get this thing running for a long period of time. 
right. Uh, so the next one we're going to talk about is inertial sensor. So inertial sensors basically gives the device an uh, idea of where he is in three-dimensional space. Now, I've included this now because these things have been around for quite a while. These include things like accelerometers and gyroscopes. So accelerometers basically measures the amount of acceleration going through the device. And gyroscopes measure the amount of uh, rotation it's going through different axes. Now, this device has uh, just been produced, I think, in 2010. And it's quite unique because basically it's combined both of them into a single package. So previously, with a lot of the accelerometers and the gyroscopes, they actually output um, a voltage, which you then have to read with the uh, analog to digital converter, and then convert that and integrate it over and do a whole lot of processing. Um, with this device, they're actually all contained within one. And it actually outputs a translation matrix and a rotation matrix. So that's going to cut down on a lot of the work that people need to do. Um, it also cuts down on drift error because previously, um, each accelerometer and gyroscope had to be in a separate package. So if you had misalignments between the axes for the accelerometers and the gyroscopes and you try to integrate that data, you get errors because they weren't basically perfectly aligned. With them coming in one package, you can kind of almost assure that it's aligned and it will never move sort of thing. And this is great. It, it sips power, and it can be used for a large variety of devices. Um, this is also um, really useful because currently, with a lot of the um, SLAM algorithms, they're relying on uh, cameras on things like uh, mobile phones or tablets. And previous SLAM algorithms were running on robots, as I was saying before. So when they were running on robots, uh, which actually had wheels and were running around in the environment, they could actually have a second source of input data beyond the um, cameras that they have on it. They had od odometry data, which is basically the wheels moving, and they can kind of estimate where they are. With a lot of the cell phones, we kind of lost, we kind of ignored that data. We didn't have it. And so we're only relying on the, the, the vision and the computer vision to determine where we are. Um, by including devices like this, we can reintroduce um, odometry data, essentially. And we can reuse a lot of the old uh, SLAM algorithms that have been using the odometry data from the robots. So the next thing I'm going to look at is the heads-up display. So this is basically what's going to allow our user to be uh, to operate in a hands-free way. Um, there's noth nothing too out of the ordinary here. It's basically actually a camera mounted on the, the sunglasses here and two embedded displays inside the visor. So the embedded displays will actually uh, show you what's on the camera, and we can then overlay uh, augmented reality information onto the, onto the screen. Um, it's got a VJ capture of about, it captures VJ video at about 30 frames per second. So it's pretty decent. And it's a, yeah, it's a good place to start. All right. So the last requirement that we're going to talk about is the technology um, of communications. Because like I said before, um, a lot of these substations, these switching stations, these transformers are going to be located out in the, out in the field where there might not necessarily be a high-speed uh, communication data. Now, currently, we're, uh, these are the wireless technologies that we have at the moment, 3G. Um, this is actually 4G uh, here. And then LTE is a proposed system that they're trying to bring in. Um, but they're still going through the uh, proposal phase at the moment. But using the current systems we have, which is still the 3G and maybe in some places 4G, we're very limited with the amount of data we have. So when we implement this uh, solution, we're gonna ha this is something we're going to have to consider. So how are we going to implement this? Very simply, with this uh, diagram that I've shown here. So this is the diagram of basically uh, where all the sensors that I talked about previously are going to fit into the system. The entire main core of the system is basically the SLAM algorithm. So the three, three, set, three sets of data, which is the depth from the connect sensor, the image from the video, uh, video, and the telemetry, which is basically the odometry data, which is the gyroscopes and the accelerometer. These are going to be fed into the SLAM algorithm. 
which is basically going to produce a 3D map of the environment and record also the position of the device in three-dimensional space inside this environment. The dotted line I've drawn there is kind of the, the communications link. So all this stuff, uh, everything above the lines happening remotely at the site, and everything below is happening at the operator's desks. So, uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, the cable's a bit finicky, so it might cut out sometimes. Yeah, just bear with me. Um, yeah, so everything above the line is uh, inside the environment. Um, hmm. So the main things we've talked about before is the telemetry, the image, and the depth, and the displays. Um, now I'm going to go into a bit more detail about the, the SLAM algorithm, which is basically going to provide the 3D mapping and the position tracking. And uh, also kind of uh, how we're going to recreate the scene on the, um, on the client side. So bearing in mind also that the link between them might not have that much data. So the first thing up is the SLAM algorithm. Now I've talked about it very quickly before. And what I'm showing right now is uh, two different algorithms. Um, previously, I've shown you the FAST algorithm and the uh, PTAM algorithm. And so they, were, they, had, ver they had relatively uh, sparse features. So this, the features that it extracted are quite far, uh, far in between. So like this one, this is actually the PTAM algorithm again. And it's only calculating, uh, you know, tracking these points as data. And it's fi actually finding those distances based on camera movements. Using stuff like the Connect, uh, using new technologies like the Connect, there's been new algorithms developed that are, that are using uh, dense feature tracking. So rather than tracking specific features over the, over the map and tracking them from frame to frame to frame, they actually use every single pixel in the camera to be a feature. So this is what I mean by dense. So every single, every single uh, depth information coming from the Kinect camera is being used as a feature and is going to be used to recreate the scene. Now, we, if, we, if we do it like this, this is great because we can see there's quite a bit of detail. Um, the picture is a bit fuzzy, but there's actually a logo engraved here about one millimeter. And that, that can actually be picked up through re repeated scanning of the scene. So that's something called uh, hyper-resolution, where basically if you have repeated measurements of the same, um, same point from different angles and different movements, you can actually get a much, uh, much more accurate information. And you kind of can get rid of that noise. Now, the problem, uh, the problem with these two, uh, oh, sorry, the difference between these two things is the hardware that they run on. So the PTAM, the PTAM algorithm actually runs on your standard smartphone. So it's a, it's a, it's a single thread uh, program, and it doesn't require a lot of computational power. The PTAM, uh, sorry, the, the, the Connect Fusion algorithm actually runs on GPU hardware. So it is uh, parallelly implemented. So every point in the pixel is basically calculated by a single, um, a single processor inside the GPU. So ideally, for our, for our research, um, we, we would like to use something like uh, uh, PTAM there because of the lower computational requirements. So we don't have to carry on a laptop with something heavy. But at this stage, um, being the start of the research, we're not throwing anything out the window just yet. And we're still going to look at the Connect Fusion, which is the more denser thing, uh, denser algorithm. Now, the last thing is, uh, after these two algorithms have um, done their thing, which is the recreation of the map and positioning themselves inside the 3D environment, we need to basically reconstruct the scene in 3D for the, uh, for the remote user. So that's where the scene reconstruction comes in. So with the, um, with the two algorithms I mentioned before, uh, PTAM and Connect Fusion, the amounts of data they send back is quite different. 
So the PTAM, al uh, the PTAM algorithm actually records, actually I'll just go back to the previous frame. The PTAM algorithm actually records key frames where it's located the feature points on each of these frames. Whereas the, um, the connect fusion algorithm actually just spontaneously generates a 3D mesh map. So the problem now is how are we going to get this information back to the user at his desk? Now, if we cannot get the, uh, all the processing done with the connect fusion on site, we're going to need to stream that data back to the client. Now, that can pose a problem because of the bandwidth that we're talking about. Um, the connect, uh, like I showed previously, was generating a depth image at 11 bits for VGA resolution. Um, that well exceeds the uh, capacity of a 3G. So we can't just stream that back to the desks to get that um, visualized on the client side. If we do go for something like connect algorithm, the reconstruction will have to be done client side, I mean uh, technician side where the map is then sent back to the, uh, to the client. If we use the PTAM algorithm, uh, I was saying before that the PTAM algorithm actually takes selected frames and feature points and creates a 3D map that way. Um, using, these, using these points, we can actually recreate a 3D scene. So we will actually be able to fill in the dots between the features and create a 3D model that way. And there's some algorithms that do that, um, like Bundler. And um, there's a demonstration uh, with Microsoft Photosynthesis that does that. So based on the implementation that we choose for the SLAM algorithm, the scene recon reconstruction will be implemented using uh, one of those two fashions that I talked about. So now that, we've, now that we've gotten all of this uh, down, we, we can track the position in 3D. We create a 3D map. Um, we can upload, we can, overlay, we can overlay augmented reality information. And we can create a more situational awareness for the client. And so we're basically going to uh, evaluate it like so. Um, so the three, three ways we're going to evaluate it is performance measures, uh, subjective measures, and qualitative data. So the first one, performance measures, is actually things like um, time taken to complete a task. So time taken for a technician to swap out a control board on a, on a transformer. And the other thing is error rate, so how many errors the operator operator makes inside that time frame. Uh, subjective measures, such as questionnaires. So that is after we've uh, given it to the people to use, we give them a questionnaire, get feedback on how they found the system, you know, wh uh, where there's any form of improvement, what they thought of it, that kind of stuff. And qualitative data, which is basically just us, us each of the operators is using it, we'll, kind of, we'll create a video recording of them. So we can see if there's anything that is common between all subjects. And this might be something that they might not even be aware of themselves, where they wouldn't be able to tell you in questionnaires that they did. But analyzing the video, we can bring out. So very briefly, that was kind of what I plan to do um, in, this, uh, in my master's thesis for this year. And because it's qu at the start of the year, it's uh, it's kind of up in the air at the moment. So I actually would like to take this time to take any questions from you guys and comments about what I proposed so far and the algorithms or any questions that you might have in general. Uh, yeah. Currently, currently uh, most of the cell phones and tablets only have acceler accelerometers. Yeah, so, new stuff yeah no, the new stuff's coming out right now, like the new iPhone 4S. 4S. Well. But I suppose my main question is, does mm -hmm. that chip do the integration of accelerometer and gyroscope on 
chip or do you yep. still have to do it? So basically this actually does integration of the data on chip. So it basically pumps out the transformation matrices and rotation matrices. Like a specified algorithm. Um, they use the motion fusion algorithm. Um, I haven't looked into that a lot, but it's it's part of the it's part of the algorithm that they've developed with their uh, their their collection of um, systems. So they have a lot of accelerometers and gyroscopes, and so they've developed this motion fusion algorithm to use that data. Um, alternatively, you can actually just pull sorry you can actually pull raw data from it. So you can pull the acceleration and gyroscope. So if you want to you know do your own, make sure it's a bit better. You can pull that data directly off the chip. Because I've done a lot of, um, well, a bit of research into what the quickest way of integrating gyroscope, mm. gyroscope data to accelerometer data. Mm. Like drawbacks from using accelerometer is obviously that you get a lot of latency mm. and you don't get very good response time, but of course there's also gyroscope drift as well. Mm. Yep, so the, the, the sensitivity of this is still about the same. The, the gyroscope drift, which is basically if you leave the gyroscope on the table and don't move it, it it'll actually kind of it record some movement, even though it's not. And that's gyroscope drift. And I think this one has about 0.1, uh, 0.5 of a degree, degree per minute. So gyroscope drift does exist. But the thing is, if we combine this with the um, with the external data. Um, sorry, you go back one slide. The gyroscope is completely self-contained, so it doesn't really have any external feedback. If we use this in conjunction with uh, feedback from the external data, like features we extract from the depth information, what we can do is basically cancel out that drift. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're basically kind of using the benefits of these two uh, different technologies. And when we combine it together, we can get rid of some of the downsides of this, which is like the gyroscope drift. And we can also reduce the computational power required by the connect. Um, a lot of algorithms actually use uh, iterative process to find the features. And if we can give the algorithm a good starting point to guess using the gyroscope data, we can reduce the computation time required by the, by the computer vision algorithms. Something quite similar to you, you this year, Samuel Williams. He's doing oh, yeah. uh, research into uh, mobile phone devices and the tracking data with gyroscope accelerometers. All that sort of, mm -hmm. all the sort of different sensors you can have, and the best way to integrate them into one is to change mm. the things. That would be great, yeah. Uh, yep. Um, so, how do you plan communication yep. between clients? So the communication currently, um, if, if we do use the um, dense tracking algorithm like uh, Connect Fusion, the communication algorithm will basically only be sending back the completed 3D map of the environment. I, I, I was more meaning like how do they talk to each other? Oh, right. Yeah. How do they talk to each other? Um, do you mean the protocol or? Yeah, are they, is this going to be like voice communication? Oh, or right, right. OK, sorry, yep, yep. So, so with a lot of current um, technical support ta sta tasks, they're actually just done just with a phone call. So using this, we're actually trying to, uh, we're trying to enhance that and augment it with uh, not only voice communications, but with this extra information as well. So the operator uh, away will have a 3D model of the world. And he, can be, he can create points on it that the end user will see. And you can still talk to them and say, look, hey, don't touch that. It's hot. Or, yeah. Okay. Mm. So you're also looking at a voice? Yeah. Well? So voice. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Sorry. Uh, operator, I mm -hmm. think after you scan that, I know take certain things on yep. the display and then that will be fed back to the, yep. uh, the display. Yep. So basically, uh, because we have the pose and we have the, we have the depth data of the, uh, the environment, um, any annotations that we generate on the client side, we can just redraw on the um, technician side. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you're talking before about the object modeling. Um, object modeling, yeah. Yep. Oh, so like scene recreation? Yep. Yeah. So do you think maybe you'd look at um, object recognition or that situation? Yeah, so that is actually. Uh, 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 an error that we could expand on. 
So kind of extracting objects from the environment. And that could be done by, some, by doing stuff like looking for edges in the environment. And then we can subtract that out and say, look, this is likely to be one thing in this environment. Um, at this stage, where we're just kind of looking to enhance the, um, the, the process of repairing something, it might not be necessary, but that's definitely something we can look into at the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I imagine that would be quite help useful, um, especially, yeah, especially if there's something that needs to be pulled out or it will automatically select the entire object for it to be pulled out sort of thing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 How would the connect come to So So the connect would have to be uh head mounted. So um that's where we're kinda looking right now at kinda how feasible it is. Um it is quite bulky, it does draw a lot of power. Um, the other option is basically just to sit it at the side and just recreate the scene that way. Um, we just remove a lot of the extra benefits that we can get from it by moving the connect around. So when, I, when we move it around, we, we get extra, uh, we, we can cancel out these shadows. So uh, on this map, we're actually just seeing the connect um, look at this uh, scene. And these black spots here are actually shadows where it can't actually see any depth information. Um, if we leave it on the table, it's great. It can give us a scene. But if we kind of move it around, it can uh, get rid of the shadows. It can uh, increase the resolution, stuff like that. Yeah. So those that would be something else to look at. Yeah. You mentioned one of the problems with bandwidth. Is it not possible with the connect just to attack the scene mm. just once? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that was what I was talking about before. Um, using, the, using the two different algorithms, how we're gonna, how we're gonna implement the communication, where the stream is gonna get re reconstructed, whether it's the um, technician side or the client side, is gonna depend on kind of which algorithm we use in the end. So if it is the connect uh, fusion algorithm, the entire scene will be generated at, on the site, and only the 3D model will be sent back along with kind of position as it's getting updated through the scene. Mm. Sorry, cheap alternatives. Um, no, uh, well, I actually haven't. I think the Connect is quite an interesting piece of hardware, as in because it is uh, it is actually so cheap. The uh, Connect itself is actually about a hundred and twenty US dollars um, compared to current laser scanning systems which can run into the thousands, this is already a very cheap um, alternative to those laser systems. Um, it does have the drawbacks that I was talking about before. But yeah, it, it is quite a new technology. And it's been, it, there's a lot of research going into it now because it's kind of, it's the other end of the spectrum. It's not very accurate, but it, get, it gets you a lot of data fast compared to the laser scanners, which is very accurate and gets you data a bit, slow, a bit slower. Mm. Mm, mm. Yeah, because actually, I think the Connect actually has a microphone array in it, so that might that might actually contribute to the length. So it needs that length to space the microphones out, so it can actually extract uh, where an audio source is coming from. If we take out stuff like that, it's got a it's got a motor in it as well to tilt it up and down. It's got an accelerometer, but it doesn't have a gyro. Uh, so if we extract those features, imagine we could squish it down into something a bit more. Um, head mountable, so we're not walking around with a giant uh, antenna on our heads. Yeah, but yeah. So the, yeah, you're right. So there is support for this hardware inside there that we can get rid of. Mm. Awesome. Uh, thanks. Uh, you, you told me application for this uh, system would be mm -hmm. like, for example, technician going to uh, you know, repair a particular, let's say, electronic system. Yep. So just like the box that you showed mm -hmm. the first. Uh, yep. Right? 
So uh, do you think uh, this, this uh, using the Kinect will help you to uh, you know, create a 3D model of a completely messy system like that? I mean, because you need to go inside or maybe just look and zoom in and zoom in and then see, OK, there's mm. a lot of things there. So mm. does it kind of help you to uh, identify that? So like that, I mean, that, that resolution? Yeah, yeah, that resolution. That's a good question, because the Kinect actually the resolution that the def comes in it at is a VGA, which is basically um, 460 by 640 by 480. Um, but using using kind of repeated measurements of the same thing and moving the connect around, we can actually generate a much uh, more detailed uh, map. The downside with this is going to be um, any major changes in the scene. So if like he removed the giant board then the Kinect is going to have to spend a lot more time to recreate the scene and you know, regather all that data. Um, the density of this, the, 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 the resolution of the map may not also be um, as important to get it completely down. Because what's happening is we're looking for the expert, which is on the client side. He, he's the guy that knows about the system. He just doesn't, we just don't want to have to fly him halfway around the world for a two hour to our job, so he'll have a general good knowledge of the system that we're, we're operating on. So even if he doesn't have the fine details, he should know more information. And he will have documentation, other stuff that he can back himself up with to help the technician on site. Yeah. Mm. So um, I, I assume that for all these devices, there are already 3D models uh, of them, because they're probably being designed using 3D models. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. So have you thought about using those models as part of the actual information that the client has? Um, sorry, sorry. Well, um, so uh, an operator goes in to work on some piece of machinery. Yep. Uh, that machinery has obviously been designed by someone mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. had application, mm -hmm. so there would be a model associated with it. Mm -hmm. So you could use that model yeah. um, for the client so that they would have that kind of information. Mm -hmm. Mm. The guesses, you know, what one's looking yeah, at, yeah. because it has the objects there already for you. Yeah, um, yeah and that, that actually uh, has come in before. I mean, if you have a model of the environment, you can just then use that to recreate, uh, figure out where you are. But in doing, also in doing it this way, we're kind of setting it up for unknown environments as well. So it extends the application. So we can also use it for stuff like uh, another group actually in, um, the Netherlands, I think, is actually using it for crime scene investigation. So they have something similar at the moment, um, and they're using it in a completely unknown environment where there's no model. And so they can kind of scan around and get the model that way. So you're right. If we do have a model, it would make our job a, a lot easier. Mm. Um, do you, for your annotations, mm -hmm. uh, have you thought much about what sort of annotations you're going to use? Are they just going to be text annotations? Um, at this stage, no. I've been kind of just focusing on figuring out how we're going to get the system up and running. Um, Have you ever thought about like using, say, you've got the sale of the Pepsi or something like that? Yeah. There's been a card removed or a card entered. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about using like three D annotations? So you've got a model reconstructed there, yeah. and the operator can just say, "Oh, slide this card in here," and then a three D model of the card will slide into where mm. it needs to go. Have mm. you ever thought of like annotations like that? Yeah, that? actually, yeah, that's actually a good point because. Um, I think with the uh, with the Connect Fusion and with the the model being generated on the technician side, you can generate quite complex um, 3D animations with good occlusion as well because it has a very detailed 3D map of the world. It can you know realistically draw these things in, and there has been work done on that before. So you could also use that uh, data to do like differentials. So say if you inventory this item before. Uh -huh. Like on the inside, then suddenly you come look at it again, and things have completely changed. But the technician's been there. Mm -hmm. You can do like a differential between what it was last like and what it is now, and then you can like get I don't know, some warnings come up or something. Yeah, like yeah, that, that, that sounds <laughs> that sounds feasible. Well, like there's a new dead rat in there somewhere, yeah. or <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, in case you didn't know, it shouldn't be there. Yeah.